Welcome to Sunday School on the Go from the First Baptist Church in Tallahassee as we begin this Sunday gathering back in our classes while others remain cautious, even in this new chapter in the life of our church. Certainly our interim pastor and pastor search committees are grateful for your prayers as they earnestly seek God's leadership in the days ahead. I'm Jim Glass, one of the teachers in Al Harris's Pairs and Spares class, and I have the privilege of guiding you through our study this quarter of some of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. In our lesson for today, August 23rd, we leave the library of wisdom that we know as the book of Proverbs and enter a little cottage next door that serves as an annex to the library of Proverbs. Its entry is restricted to those who have the maturity to seek a greater understanding of the closest of personal relationships. Not many people visit this little cottage library. It seems out of place with the towering structure of Proverbs and rather mysterious when compared with the library of Ecclesiastes that sits on the same campus. Yet here in these eight rooms of this hidden gem are beautiful images of love reserved for those who choose to pursue love in God's way and in God's time. It's called the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. The first verse of the book tells us it is Solomon's Song of Songs. It holds a very unique position in God's Word. Its place in the collection of our sacred writings has rarely been questioned, either by Jews or Christians, but its meaning has been variously understood. One commentator states quite bluntly that this is the most obscure book of the Old Testament, while another says, no other book of Scripture has been so much abused by an unscientific spiritualizing and an over-scientific unspiritual treatment as this has. And if you were to take the time to read some of the various commentaries and explanations of this book, you would find that to be all too true. Well, several things make it so unique. It's a poem, and at first glance, not all the pieces appear to fit together. The pictures can be rather graphic, and many have avoided it because of this. However, it's an honest and forthright portrayal of the journey toward and realization of the richness of marital love. Because it's poetry, writers, scholars, and Bible students throughout the ages have approached it in various ways. Most popular are the allegorical, dramatic, and literal interpretations. Let me offer a very brief description of each. Allegorical interpretation says that the true meaning of a story or text is hidden and deeper than the words suggest on the surface. For example, the earliest Jewish scholar commentator that we know of believed that the first half, chapters 1 through 4, spoke of the times of the Exodus through the first temple, while the second half, chapters 5 through 8, referred to the fall of Judah through all the time that followed up to the final restoration of Israel. Other Jewish authors believe that the Song of Solomon is really a picture of the love between God and Israel. Some Christian writers have said that the love between the beloved and his bride is an allegorical type or a preview of the love between Christ and his church. This approach to the Song of Solomon has been quite popular throughout history. But contrary to what the allegorical interpreter, interpreter suggests, although it's possible to draw those applications from the text, the primary meaning is not mysteriously hidden away somewhere. The dramatic interpreters see this simply as a play created for an audience in which the beloved and his bride are the main characters. Well, the problem with this is that there are facts of history in the background of the poem, facts that are quite beautiful and even romantic. The love of the great king for one of his own subjects, a lovely maiden from the north whose prudence and purity of character get his attention. And the fact that romantic dramas like this were unknown in this part of the ancient world of Solomon's day. Third is the literal view of the Song of Solomon, that the beloved and his bride were real people who lived where they said they lived, acted as they said they did, and experienced love in all its emotions just the way they described them. 
Although there's no other record of the marriage of Solomon to a shepherdess from northern Palestine, by whose beauty and nobility of soul the great king had been captivated, the pictures we find in the Song of Solomon of life in 10th century BC Israel are real depictions. And the words and images from peaceful meadows to royal processions are all meant to help us understand the grandeur and glory, as well as the simplicity and natural beauty of wholesome and genuine love between a man and a woman who find love together in God's design for them. There appear to be three main speakers in the book, the bride, the beloved, and the chorus of virgins, also called the daughters of Jerusalem. But it's not always clear who is actually speaking. The bride is a maiden of a relatively low level of society who, nevertheless, loves the king, but not for his wealth or position. The beloved is a king, but he's also spoken of as a shepherd. He is generally understood to have been Solomon himself. The Song of Solomon is a story of his romantic relationship with a woman from Shulem or Shunem, one of the cities given to Issachar when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River to take possession of the land that God had given to them, just as he had promised to Abraham. Eusebius, a third century Christian historian, identifies Shunem as lying some five miles south of Mount Tabor. The location is presently occupied by the city of Solom, a village three miles north of Jezreel and five miles from Gilboa. In the first chapter of 1 Kings, we read that David, King David, now an old man, was unable to keep himself warm even with blankets. So his servants went looking for a young maiden to lie beside him to keep him warm. They found, so we read in verse 3, a beautiful young lady named Abishag and brought her to the king. We don't know for sure, but it's very possible that Abishag is the young Shulamite maiden that Solomon took to be his bride in the Song of Solomon. In the first verse of this book, we have the general description of the book. It's Solomon's Song of Songs. In the second verse, the bride speaks. She introduces herself by describing her great desire to be with her beloved and that her darkened skin came from working in the sun because her brothers forced her to while her own vineyard went untended. In verse 9, her beloved, the king, declares his love for her. Through the end of the first chapter and through verse 6 of chapter 2, their conversations express their obvious attraction to one another and their growing love for each other. At a pause in this conversation, in verse 7 of chapter 2, the bride cautions her friends, the daughters of Jerusalem, not to arouse or awaken love until it's the right time. We'll hear that message twice more in the book, so you know this message is very important. In verses 10 through 14, their conversation continues, and the king invites his bride to walk through a vineyard. Well, it's spring, and love is in the air. Through the rest of chapter 2, they continue to speak of their love for one another. As chapter 3 begins, we find the bride searching desperately for her beloved. At last, in verse 4, she finds him and takes him to her mother's house. The remainder of chapter 3 and all of chapter 4 through the first verse of chapter 5 describe the wedding celebration, their first night as husband and wife, and their deep, passionate growing love for one another. The focal text for our lesson today begins with Solomon speaking in verse 15 of chapter 2, but I'd like to include the first paragraph of, from verse 14. My dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. Because of his great love for her, he has sought her out in the places she might find to hide because she is so shy and modest and self-conscious about her appearance 
and her lowly state when compared to that of the king. He says, she has hidden herself in the clefts of the rock on the side of the mountain. Wild doves in that area typically chose high and inaccessible rocks as their resting places. As we read, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 48. In spite of what she might think of herself, he finds her to be the most attractive woman he's ever known and knows how sweet her voice is to him. So he gently calls her from her hiding place. It's not clear whether the bride answers the king's enticement with what comes next in verse 15 or if the king is speaking. Either way, what we have in verse 15 is what many have been, may have been part of a vine dresser's song. If the bride is speaking, she may have been referring to the work forced upon her by her brothers that would keep her from becoming the king's bride. If the king is speaking, which is more likely, it could be that he's warning her in figurative language of the possible threats to their growing relationship. Since it's springtime, and the vineyard is in full production, foxes were known to be common predators. Although they're generally carnivorous, they also eat plants and grapes, as in this case. They also dig holes in vineyards, thereby destroying the roots. They make trails through the garden, destroying the vines as they go. And they even bite off the young shoots of the vines. And of course, they eat the grapes. These little foxes appear cute and playful. And they aren't thought of as a great threat to their little farm, but their appetites and behavior could be very destructive. Practically speaking, and really regardless of who is speaking, the message is the same. Be on guard for all those things that would interfere with the purity of our growing and deepening relationship. One commentator writes, the vineyards, beautiful with fragrant blossoms, point to her covenant of love. And the foxes, the little foxes, which might destroy those united vineyards, point to all the great and little enemies and adverse circumstances that threaten to gnaw and destroy love in the blossom ere it has reached the ripeness of full enjoyment. Well, every relationship has its own little foxes that threatens its love, its faithfulness, and its unity. Previous relationships that are not completely set aside can threaten commitment on the part of the one who came from that relationship and can threaten the security on the part of the one who's now trying to compete with that former friend or spouse, moving too fast or going too far in a relationship before marriage is also a great threat to future happiness, especially if that relationship does not lead to marriage. So many individuals bring a host of baggage into a marriage because of hasty decisions or immoral choices. The friends of one member of the couple may become an obstacle in the relationship because of their enticements to bad habits, poor decisions, and sin, because of the inappropriate influence they may have, and because of the time one member of the couple may spend with friends at the expense of the other and the relationship. Sometimes, parents can be an obstacle. So that's why Scripture says a man should leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. We might add that the wife should likewise be united to her husband with the parent's blessing, but not their control or her overdependence on them. Work commitments can be an obstacle to a relationship. As one person seeks, maybe advancement or promotion or self-esteem in his or her work or spends time at work in order to avoid seeking resolution to conflicts at home. Church involvement, time with extended family, and leisure activities can also provide a harmful distraction to a relationship. Truth is, many of these things are good in and of themselves, but if they interfere with healthy, positive growth in a relationship, they also can be extremely damaging to the couples involved and also to their children. Then there's a wandering eye, selfishness, anger, poor self-esteem, dishonesty, sarcasm, playing hurtful games, isolation, unfaithfulness. And the list can go on and on of other threats to healthy relationships. In fact, 
We can spend the next several hours talking about just some of the obstacles and challenges couples face and might be facing right now in maintaining and strengthening their relationships. But what we have here in our scripture is a glimpse into the solution. Talk about those pesky little foxes early in the relationship so we can catch them before they ruin our vineyard. Communicate your expectations, fears, hopes, dreams, and hurts, and the history behind them to your boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, or spouse, so that together you can identify those little foxes that creep in, so you can catch them before they do any more damage, and so you can enjoy the fruit of the vineyard that you are cultivating, nourishing, and fostering without the dam damage those pesky little foxes can have. Let me just add here that perhaps you would need to see, uh, you, you would have the need to speak to a counselor. Brother Barry is available here at our church to meet with you to help you identify and catch those little foxes that are harming or destroying your vineyard. Or there are other counselors that you could speak to to help you guard your heart and the heart of your home as well. For those individuals who are seeking God's husband or God's wife, communication like we have here is so important to guide a budding relationship to a place of healthy growth and development. We can also apply this same principle to our relationship with the Lord. The very same kind of distractions that take away from our relationship with our spouse can also hinder our walk with the Lord. Once again, it's important to identify those little foxes, catch them before they can do any more damage and restore and renew your relationship with the Lord. Maybe a good question to ask at this point is this, what do you need to do today to guard the relationships in your life and protect them or deliver them from the little foxes that are ruining your vineyard? You can imagine that Solomon's hope for him and his bride would be something like, let this blossoming love of two souls joined together continue to be pure and holy. As they grow in their love for one another, may they also grow in their love for the Lord, who alone can bind them together as one. In the last two verses of chapter 2, we find a brief snapshot of the depth of commitment and dedication this couple has for each other. My beloved is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. Their commitment to each other is complete and exclusive. My beloved is mine, and I am his. This verse is so simple, yet so far-reaching and comprehensive. Her beloved has entrusted everything to her, and she has entrusted everything to him. He's held nothing back from her, and she's held nothing back from him. Her love for him, his love for her, doesn't depend on what she or he can do, what he or she has, or any other condition. Their love is unconditional. It's also safeguarded. His heart is not shared with any other, and neither is her heart. Their relationship is exclusive. Nothing can interfere with the inseparable bond between them. Their love is faithful. Since nothing separates their total commitment to each other now, and they have pledged themselves to each other into the future, nothing will ever interfere with the unity they share. Their love is also mutually submissive. He belongs to her and she belongs to him. And mutual submission includes mutual surrender. Although they still remain individual persons, they've given themselves completely over to the other. Neither can claim ownership over his or her own life because they've surrendered their lives to the other. She is responsible to him and for him, and he is responsible to her and for her. Each person is now concerned with helping the other become everything God desires and designed them to be. Their first priority is not themselves, but the other. As a result, their love 
is an everlasting love. If each is committed so completely to the other, there's no opportunity for anything to disrupt the trust, loyalty, commitment, and mutual submission that binds them so tightly together. As this unconditional, exclusive, and everlasting love grows, this couple will indeed live happily ever after. Now Solomon doesn't provide us with an explanation of how this mutual submission plays out in their relationship. We have to look to the New Testament to find that in the writings of Paul and Peter. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33, Paul tells us a mystery about Christian couples that reflects the relationship between Christ and His church. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, we find a second prescription for mutual submission in a Christian marriage. In both, the greater responsibilities and the more difficult responsibilities fall to the husbands. As husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church, thus providing the security they need, and as wives respect their husbands, giving them the affirmation and encouragement they need, marriages fulfill their divine design. There is no, no other more complete picture of the marriage that God desires than this. My beloved is mine and I am his. And, by the way, there's no room for any pesky little foxes in this kind of arrangement. In the second half of verse 16, we hear the bride say, He browses among the lilies, or he pastures his flock among the lilies. This could well be an affirmation of his love for and commitment to her. In her question back in chapter 1, verse 7, we know that he was a shepherd himself. Here, her statement suggests that just as he tenderly cares for his sheep, he spreads radiance, joy, and loveliness wherever he goes. And she's been the individual that he has chosen to lavish his love upon. Lilies were an emblem of purity and a representation of those things that are noble and exalted. The lily stalk has been regarded as a symbol of new life. And in early Christian art, Mary was pictured with a lily in her hand when the angel Gabriel made his announcement that she would bear the Messiah. In this picture, Solomon portrays his love for his bride as a lily, one of whose excellence and beauty he feeds upon in self-surrender and delight. The imagery continues in verse 17, where the bride speaks of her beloved like a gazelle or young deer. She asks that he depart from her until later in the day. Until the day breaks literally means until the day breathes, referring to the time when the fresh evening winds begin to blow, as we read, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, as the cool of the day. The time when the shadows flee is a time when they can no longer be seen as the sun sets. Until that, come, until that time comes, she asks him to be about the work that he has to do in self-denying humility, patient modesty, and inward delight in the joy of her beloved. She lets him go for the moment. As the sun sets, she longs for her beloved to return swiftly and gracefully like an agile, noble animal racing home, gracefully leaping over what obst whatever obstacles might lie in his path. The location of the mountains of beth -er, as some translations read, is, is not known. The word beth -er comes from a word that meant to cut or divide, as a mountain might be divided or cut by streams and rivers. So some translations simply use the word rugged rather than an actual place name. Chapter 2 closes with the king absent from his bride-to-be. As the day ends, she lays her head on her pillow and goes to sleep. Here's what happened next in verses 1 through 4. All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the cities. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. 
I held him and would not let him go till I brought him to my mother's house to the room of the one who conceived me. In these verses, she appears to tell about a dream she had during the night. And it's generally agreed among scholars that this really was a dream. First, a pure and prudent young maiden would not be looking for her husband-to-be in her bed or in the middle of the night. Second, if the beloved of her soul had been a shepherd, which he was, she wouldn't have been looking for him in the city but in the fields out tending his sheep. Third, the words she uses as she relates this story reflect more of a dream than an actual event. The king had not returned to see her the previous evening, so she went to bed not knowing where he was or what might have happened to him. The word that we have translated night is actually plural, nights. She's now gone to bed for perhaps several nights now, not having seen the beloved of her soul, and she's afraid he has left or forgotten her. Because she's now lost the feeling of his nearness, she begins to doubt his love for her. But the more she thought she was no longer loved, the deeper became her desire to find him. With these thoughts in mind, as she drifted off to sleep, it was only natural that her dreams were filled with the anguish and fear of having lost him. So, in her dreams, she went searching for him. Maybe you had a dream where you looked and looked for something and thought you never would find it as the dream went on and on and on. Then, at the very end of your dream, you found what you were looking for. That seems to be the story she's telling here. In verse 2 she says, I will get up now. She speaks to herself here, and this is one of the indications that this was a dream and not a real event. She decides to go into the city in hopes that she might find her beloved there. Because the word for city that is used here refers to a place of any size that had defenses of some kind, like walls, as opposed to a small village, She's probably not thinking of Jerusalem, but something much smaller, probably in the region where she was at the time. Though she looked and looked, she couldn't find him. So in verse 3, the watchmen found her as they made their rounds in the city. Here again, we find an indication that this was a dream, since it would have been far more reasonable for her to search for him during the day. Since they found her... It may have been that she had gotten lost or was in danger of going looking in some place that would not have been safe. Even as she dreams, she knows there are unseen eyes watching her and hidden hands protecting her in her confusion and searching. She asks the watchmen if they have seen her beloved. Oddly enough, we don't read that they answered her. Just another possible indication that this was a dream. Finally, in her dream, in verse 4, she finds her beloved. Soon after she had passed the watchman, she finds him whom my soul loves. She takes hold of him and doesn't let him go until she brings him to her mother's house. Since it's still night, she wakes her mother up to introduce her to her future son-in-law. Now, the point of this dream, as related by the bride, is to show that as passionate, ecstatic, and intense as her love and devotion are, it's not the careless, lustful affection of a woman of less moral character, but the pure love of a noble, God-fearing woman. Both the intensity and purity of her love are very clear in these verses. She's madly in love with the king. She wants to be his wife in every possible way, yet she knows there are pleasures of marital bliss not to be explored or experienced until after the marriage is confirmed. The guards who find her are a reminder that there are those watching unmarried couples today who would rescue them from a hasty, foolish, or unrestrained decision. She may have been considering doing something she would later have regretted had they not found her. We're reminded of Paul's hopeful words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 when he writes, No temptation has come upon you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can do, in what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also 
provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. When she finds her beloved in her dream, there were, there were so many things they could have done, but they chose the path of righteousness. They went to her mother's house to celebrate their reunion in a protected and protective environment. What they did, they did publicly, honorably, and in the fear of God. To take a phrase from a wedding sermon. There's no sneaking around, no fear of getting caught, no regrets afterwards. This couple is doing things right. Not only do they understand that, that as a couple, the bride wants others to understand how vitally important purity in a relationship before marriage is. So she tells her friends, those we know as the daughters of Jerusalem, Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. We've heard this advice once before in chapter 2, verse 7, and we'll hear it again in chapter 8, verse 4. The point of her appeal to them is that they not seek to arouse or awaken the emotions of marital love or allow themselves to be drawn too deeply into a relationship before the time is right, before God awakens in each of them a holy and righteous desire for the other. Until God moves in their hearts to draw them together, they should allow those feelings to remain at rest. Just as the gazelles and does of the field are shy and timid animals, yet completely free to go where they please, genuine love is a shy and gentle attraction that does not puff itself up, does not boast, and does not seek its own, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The marital intimacy that makes a husband and wife one flesh is to be reserved for the appropriate time. Now the word we have translated, until it so desires, or until it pleases, is just one two-letter word in Solomon's language. It's used in several different ways in the Old Testament and refers here to the entire spectrum of time beginning at the instant when a girl and a boy are first surprised by the feelings they have for one another through the moment when love determines it's the right time. That is, when God, who is the author of love, says it's the right time. That moment when the man and the woman who have each entrusted their lives to Christ publicly acknowledge that as they have trusted in the Lord with all their hearts, it is God who has brought them together and is calling them to join their lives as one under His Lordship and His leadership. It's important to note that this prudent advice is, to a large degree, the moral of the entire book of the Song of Solomon, as it aims to preserve the chaste and truly moral, moral character of marital love. In this way, the purity of love and the power of love meet the way and at the moment God intends so that both the husband and wife might enjoy the blessings of allowing God to make their paths straight. Tragically, far and few between are those who choose to wait on the Lord and restrain themselves from pursuing the lusts of the flesh. Far, few, far too few, few children and far too few adults know today the blessings of deferred love, love that waits for the right time, God's time. This poem of Solomon's is a deeply passionate picture of love, but love that is to be reserved for and preserved in the holy and righteous context of two lives in Christ becoming one flesh, modeling for the world Christ's love for His church his bride. As you reflect on this lesson, perhaps there are little foxes that are ruining your vineyard that you need to deal with today. Perhaps there are obstacles to your relationship with your spouse that need to be discussed and resolved. Perhaps there are some things you and your future spouse need to talk about before your relationship goes any farther. Perhaps you've already gone too far and you need to reestablish the proper boundaries that God has set. Perhaps you need to consider the bride's love for her beloved and his love for her and compare that to your own love for your wife or your husband. The Song of Solomon provides some great examples 
of the proper expression of passion in marriage. Finally, perhaps there are others who need to hear this message of God's love and God's plan for their lives. As a watchman of God, you could be the one to gently and lovingly encourage a young man or a young woman or a young couple to follow the Lord's guidance in their relationships with others. God does indeed have a beautiful plan for us as individuals, but also for us as married couples as we wait to awaken love in God's time and in God's way. Thank you for being a part of our brief peek into this beautiful poem of Solomon. Next week, we turn to a second passage in this book in chapter 5, verses 6 through 16, our last study in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament before we begin a new study from the book of Isaiah. May God bless you as you feast on His Word today and throughout the week to come as you grow in knowledge through the study of God's Word I pray that you would also grow in wisdom as you seek to apply it to your life, trusting in the Lord with all your heart, seeking opportunities to reflect God's light in a dark world, beginning first in your closest relationships. In the meantime, as we're still reminded, keep calm and wash your hands. God bless you.